Welcome to the Jill on Money Show. It's Saturday, March 9th. I am so excited and so is Mark because after a bunch of years, while we were doing remote interviews, we are back in the studio and who better than one of your favorite guests ever to join us. We have the amazing, the fantastic Ed Slot. Ed is a CPA by training, but he has become America's IRA expert, and his website is irahelp.com. He has always been a great friend of the program. He gives us all these fabulous tax charts, and we are just delighted to have him. So for the next couple of weekends, we are going to be joined by the best ever, the man, the myth, the legend, Ed Slot. Let's get started today. Mark and I are talking to Ed about tax season. What do people need to know about filing their 2023 taxes that is important for this year? Nothing. (laughs) (laughs) People ask me that all the time. All you're doing is recording history, things that already happened. What you should be looking at is the woulda, coulda, shoulda, you know, for years as a tax accountant. Luckily, I figured this out in my late 20s and early 30s. People used to come in, I did their taxes, and I would always be the bearer of bad news. I would look at it, oh, if you only did the, oh, you shoulda done, oh, if you only did this whole woulda, coulda, shoulda. And I realized all I'm doing is recording, you know, being a history teacher, looking backwards. There's a big difference between tax preparation, which is what people are doing now, and tax planning looking forwards. So if anything, learn from what you're doing now uh, so you don't have this woulda, coulda, shoulda every year. There's almost nothing you can do now that will change other than having a time machine Mm. that will change last year other than making maybe an IRA or Roth IRA contribution, which you can do. And it'd be effective for last year and do it up to April 15th this year. So if anything, look at your return and look at all the opportunities you might have missed, like not taking advantage of these super low tax rates. Let's um, let's do this. So first of all, I want to say that every year that you have come on this program and Mark, what did you say? How many years has it been? Ten? It's got to be at least ten. Yeah. Started. We dragged him into the studio at Mm -hmm. CBS year after year. Then we did some COVID episodes and you did a <laughs> webinar with us. And now we're now look in, at this beautiful isn't place gorgeous. We're, yeah, we're in the great. compound studio. It's fantastic. I got Brian Park behind me, it, the library. The, everything I mean, is good, right? Mm. Now, as we talk about taxation, I thought it was amazing because every year when you come, you bring me these gorgeous tax charts. Yes. And this is a history of tax rates in the United States. Yes. Now, I notice you go back to 1913, which is good. That's when you and I were in high school, right? Yeah, yeah, it was well, great. Yeah. So what is important as we look at the top federal income tax rate by year? What do you think pops out on this chart? Well, the key word is history, because you have to look back at history. Everybody complains about taxes. Nobody likes paying taxes, but they're they're going to have to be paid. So what I do is I use this in seminars, and I tell people, look at history. These are the good old days. You don't realize how good it is now. We're historically, we're in the lowest tax rates most people will ever see in their lifetime. So in this chart that you're showing, I highlighted the years the baby boomers were born, just as a frame of reference, 1946 through 1964. The top federal tax rate for each of those years exceeded 90, 90, 90%, percent, 90 percent, except for the last year, 1964, that's when the Beatles came to America, and I guess everybody got so happy they lowered the top federal rate all the way down to only 77 percent, and I hear, I don't really know, I was only 10 years old, but I hear the whole country did a happy dance, oh, only 77 percent, happy days. That's more than double today's top rate. But so, you also say that during that time, very few people paid that 91%. No, very, so what, well, what yeah. was happening in well, that time? Well, you had massive types of deductions, which we don't have. So we have lower rates, but we also have almost no deductions anymore. Mm-hmm. If you look uh, what they did in the recent tax law a few years back, they doubled the standard deduction and raised it every year and every year. Now, according to the IRS, 
over 90% of the people use a standard deduction. Almost nobody has deductions anymore. Even if you have a mortgage, you're in New York like here, big deal, you pay taxes, you're limited to 10,000. Uh, you know, and there's big, the sl- you know, the uh, state local taxes, where they call it. The, Salt. Yeah. 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 Uh, nobody gets that. I don't care how many ta- uh, state local real estate, state taxes you're paying. So when it comes down to it, unless you have a load of charity or a, a Unfortunately, a load of medical expenses, you're going to use the standard deduction. So when you look at that, just out of curiosity, I'm sorry to interrupt. Is that a fairer system? Is it a better system? It's a simpler system system for most people. They got rid of all the job and, you know, as an accountant, when I used to do tax returns, that was the toughest thing, you know, to get all the job-related expenses, your union dues, this, traveling to work, was this for work, was this personal, Mm -hmm. how much did you use the car, personal business, you had to go through all of these things. Now most people are getting higher deductions than they had otherwise. So is that, and is that a good thing or a bad thing? I think thing? it's a good thing because people complain, the people that do complain, say, I lost all my deductions. The ones who had the highest deductions, they didn't realize it. They didn't get them anyway due to the alternative minimum tax. I used to have tax, tax clients say, you forgot all my deductions because I didn't put them down. So then I, to stop all the calls, I used to put them down on Schedule A, list all the deductions. They didn't get them anyway, but at least I didn't get the calls because they saw it on the return. They thought they got them. But uh, even the state and local taxes, you didn't get them anyway because if they got high enough, the alternative minimum tax wiped them out. It was like a second tax yes. system. Okay. Can- I, I was going to ask you, 91% federal tax rate sounds absolutely insane. When you factor in the deductions from back then, what do you think it was in reality? It was way higher than it is now. Maybe if it's, and not everybody had deductions, and, and most people were in the lower brackets. Remember, this chart, the key word there I said was history, but top. Top, top rates for the top mm-hmm. earners. But still, the top rate today is only 37% compared to 90%. I mean, it's a, it's a big difference. So if you look at 2024 taxes um, for this coming up year, and we'll just put this up because this is for the current year, and you look at the... It says the the marginal tax rate, and you're going to remind everybody that you don't pay. Everyone's like, oh, I'm in the top bracket. They think that goes back to dollar no, zero. No. It does not. Okay, <laughs> so it's a graduated. Okay, but what's also interesting, and you pointed this out before we got on the air, is not just that the tax rates, the marginal tax rates are low, but the range the is wide. Have expand- yeah, and who do we have to thank for it? Inflation. Everybody complains about inflation because it does mean prices go up. Mm-hmm. But when it comes to taxes, inflation's great because each year they have cost of living adjustments due to inflation that expand the brackets. The rates don't change, but more money can pass through a low 22, 24 percent. Who ever heard of these rates? And and those brackets, when inflation, let's say, goes back to uh, a more reasonable level, right? It's not like the brackets are going to get smaller. They'll They're never not, get they smaller. They never get it smaller. Will, it will just increase by less. The year 22 to 23, we had that high inflation. Mm-hmm. The brackets swelled up. I think the inflation rate was like 8%. Now it's down to 2 or 3%, something like that. So, But you still see expansion of the brackets. And in that respect... Because those brackets are so wide, you are seeing, for example, like you can make almost up to, let's say if you're married, $384,000 yeah. for this year in 2024 and find yourself in the top bracket Only of 24. Only for the top tier. Remember, you still get some at 10, 12, you know, it's graduating. What is the effective tax rate that people need to keep in mind when they start complaining about their taxes? How do they figure that out? Well, they all they have to do is take the actual tax over their income, and that's the actual effective rate. And if you're a, a let's say, a middle class earner. It could be earner, 15, 20 percent exactly. for a lot of people. That's they right. look at, oh, I'm in the 24. That's just the top dollars. That's the mar- what we call the marginal rate, the the tax rate paid on the last dollar of income. A lot of the people who also have brokerage accounts and they want to talk about capital gains. So tell us a little bit about 
where we are in the capital gains rate history. All right. On the capital gains rate, which you'll see on this chart, there's a 0% bracket for long-term uh, capital gains uh, here. And uh, it goes up to 94000 That sounds great. And you hear people say, oh, I pay 0%. No, almost nobody gets the 0% rate. It sounds good because the way the tax law works, it's, it's uh, sneaky. How? Yeah, because <laughs> ordinary income gets taxed first. So if you have a job that pays fifty, sixty thousand, 60000 or you do uh, pensions or IRA distributions, and it goes up to, say, in this case, 94000 you're out of the 0%, 0 bracket. It uses that up. Mm -hmm. Most people fall into the 50 percent rate for long, but which is fantastic. I was just going to say, so still good. Now, let's say uh, Mark tells me to buy NVIDIA at the beginning of last year, mm. and we make a bunch of money in this stock, and we sell the stock. Now, is the gain of that stock included in the the income level. Yes, but it's taxed on a separate like off a separate rate chart. So let's do this. So let's say that Mark and I were married. Oh God, it's so beautiful. For taxes. You for, do taxes. It for taxes. We're doing it for taxes. So we're married and let's say together we make two hundred thousand dollars. Yeah. Okay. We sell a hundred thousand dollars over NVIDIA stock. What's the tax rate going to be on that? The 15%. Just 15%. Now- Assuming you, you don't get any of the zero, you're not going to get the 0% because right. you just told me you had- Right. Now, what about, what's the extra 3.8%? Oh, yeah. That's I'm sorry. The thing. That's the thing. That's the net investment income tax, something we used to call it the health care taxes, which was supposed to, I don't know if they were supposed to be temporary, but it never seems to be anything temporary in taxes. In fact, if you look, go back to that history of tax rates mm. back in the uh, negotiations uh, for the first, the 16th Amendment when it started in 1913. They had this, I think it was 7%. You have it in front of you. Yeah, 7% rate. And some of the congressmen back then said, I don't know if we want to open this Pandora's box. We haven't had a, a t an income tax. And they said, what? It'll never get over 10%. Never. And it, and, it, and it only affects like seven families. It was meant for the Rockefellers, the Carnegies, the Vanderbilts, and that ilk. And they said, it's only for those like seven families. Don't worry about it. So they didn't put a cap. Now look where we are. Well, and then so I'm just going to say that there is this, um, this is in the investment income, yeah. the, the magic chart of yeah. the surtax. What now is this is meant to do? What is that supposed to do? It's supposed to tax passive income, interest, dividends, capital gains, things we were just talking about for an extra tax when your income goes over certain thresholds, which are high thresholds, married, joint, 250, single. Uh, 200,000. But what's interesting about this provision is that it's never been indexed for inflation. Yeah, so, that's what uh, I'm wondering. Yeah, it never was. So you end up paying more of that. And also self-employment income, there's a version of that for this. So they get a little of everybody on here <coughs> and they get a little more because as your income, <coughs> excuse me, goes up for inflation, this doesn't. It's very similar. There's one other provision. Do you know it that was never adjusted for inflation? Uh, what was not adjusted for inflation? The tax on Social Security. Oh, right. And that is so low. People say, oh, you know, I. Uh, we always talk about, oh, your Social Security is going to get hit at 85%, mm. not 85, 85% tax. People make mistake that. 80 up to 85% of your social security benefits can be taxable. Tax. Uh -huh. Taxable can be taxed. And people say, well, I want to get under that. You'd have to be at the poverty level now to get under that. Because that number was like 45? 45, yeah, yeah like that's that. nuts. Right. But it was never, and it was done over 20 years ago, maybe even longer, maybe 30 years ago now. And, uh, they said that would be, you know, that we would never tax your Social Security. And people never forgot that. I do a lot of consumer seminars. And when I talk about the Roth IRA, I always get a question. Will they ever tax Roth IRAs? You know, they did that with Social Security. I said that was 30 years. Up, but I don't forget. Oh, my God. They <laughs> never forget. So if we look back and you're filing right now and, you know, I guess a lot of people want to know I'm a W-2 yeah. wage earner. Do I need to have a CPA? 
Do I? Well, it depends what else is on your return. If it, you just have a W-2 and some interest in dividends, may, and you're taking a standard deduction, it sh- which most people do, it should be easy. But if you start with a Schedule C, you have a small business, or you have rental properties, or you have pass-throughs from little corporations, LLCs, partnerships that you might have, then it gets a little complicated. And if you have high investment income, we talk about this 3.8% surtax on net investment investment income, you might start doing your taxes and say, what is this tax? Well, we have more, Ed. There will be tomorrow. There'll be next weekend. But in the meantime, if you have financial questions, tax questions, any questions about Roth, wait until you hear about our whole Roth thing, because Ed is the man who convinced Mark wholeheartedly to dive into the Roth. Any question you have, just go to our website, jillonmoney.com. Click the Contact Us button and write us your note. If you'd like to join us on the air live, Well, then all you need to do is check that box. And if you want to come on our video show, Jill on Money, powered by The Compound, check that box. While you're on the website, don't forget you have just a few days before we have our next Jill on Money live webinar. It is with Cal Newport. He is a best-selling author. He's one of the world's top productivity experts. I am so excited to talk to him. That webinar will take place March 19th. So just days away, but you must be a member of Jill on Money Live to join us. And that membership is so cheap. It's only 35 bucks. So snap to it. $35. You will be able to see the next webinar. You'll be able to see all the previous webinars and three more after this, as well as a lot of special bonus video content that lives behind that very, very, very low paywall. Check it out. All right, you can subscribe to this podcast on the Odyssey app or wherever you find your favorite podcast. Try to do something nice for someone else today. Change your work, change your wealth, change your life. Thanks for listening, and we'll talk to you tomorrow. Tomorrow.